we had the opportunity to actually fly down to Florida uh, twice. Uh, the first time we flew down, we actually strapped in, and I ended up spending about five hours on my back, and the weather didn't allow us to launch. And then we had a problem with uh, one of the main engine control electronic boxes. So we got to fly back to Houston, uh, got one day off, uh, and then we did, we did some simulators, make sure we were right up to speed, and came back for another launch. You see Dom suiting up. Dom's a Navy test pilot, captain selectee, and as I said, he's on his second mission. There's Gerhardt, our uh, backup spacewalker. Uh, we didn't have to do one, but we were prepared to do one for normal orbiter problems or any payload problems. And Janet in her uh, spacewalking suit or EVA suit, again, through some of our training, she was uh, next with uh, Dom. You can see on launch day, Janet was really excited and all set to go. As well, uh, Janice, here's uh, Janice also. In our uh, dress rehearsal that we do a couple of weeks before launch, we actually get to drive an armored personnel carrier that in case we had any kind of problems there at the, uh, the Cape, we kind of get to get away. Uh, there's Memorial giving us the okay sign, and he's ready for his uh, second mission. Kind of really uh, looking forward to it. We go ahead and walk out down the ramp, and this is the time we actually uh, go launch. It was just an outstanding day. Uh, we were all set and ready to go. Down there in the bottom corner, in the white bottom corner, in the white, uh, we've got uh, astronaut John Harrington along with uh, Carlos Gillis who helped strap us in. Uh, we're out there on the pad and everything is uh, go. We just had the, the slight delays that you heard when giving the awards. Then they uh, said go ahead and launch. Of course, we light up the main engine six seconds prior to launch and that's because we want to check the thousands of parameters. If anything's wrong, we can shut those down. We get the rock that we can definitely feel, and then there come the solids. And I know a lot of you have heard this before, but when the solids light, you really know that something significant in your life has happened. <laughs> You're just not sure if it's good or not. Uh, it was a gorgeous day from inside the cockpit. We do the roll the heads down, and, and we're on a 57 degree inclination, so going up the coast. Here's another view from the inside. Slight little rumble when the main engines start, and then here we go, bang, there goes those solids. And uh, of course, uh, Janice is in the back, looks a little washed out here, but she's got this big old grin because she just knows that we're on our way and uh, we're gonna get ready to do something that we've been training for for over a year. It takes us uh, two minutes to get rid of the, the solids. You can see the big uh, trail that's led by it. After two minutes, uh, two big cannon shots as we jettison the, the solid rocket motors. Um, they will burn out. The nose cone has parachutes in them, and they will all be recovered off the coast of Florida, uh, about 50 miles out. Um, and then it takes us uh, another six and a half minutes, once we get rid of the solids, to just go ahead and burn the remainder of fuel in the uh, external tank. We want to get to orbital velocity, which is five miles a second, or 17,500 miles an hour. And once we jettison the external tank, which goes into either the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, we're ready to get to work. The first thing we have to do after we get into orbit is open the payload bay doors. This shiny surface is a radiator that lets us get rid of waste heat. We need to get that open within a few hours of arriving in orbit or we'd have to come back home because we generate so much waste heat. We also have a radar that allows us to send the payload data down at 45 megabits per second and we can get that deployed. Now we're ready for payload operations. You see Janet Gerhardt here turning on the payload systems and the next major event is getting the mast out. You can see the tip plate here starting out and a mast coming with it. The mast is going to be 200 feet long when fully extended, the largest rigid structure ever in space up to this time, and it all folds down into a six-foot package. So it's a very clever mechanical design that allows that all to happen so smoothly, and you see how well it comes out here. This is the X-band panels and the C-band panels on the outboard antenna that will be at the end of the 200-foot mast. You see a graphic here showing that process. Here's the outboard antenna that's going to have to be flipped over to do mapping. And you can see how impressive that total structure is. The mast uh, triples the moment of inertia of the shuttle when it's that hanging that far outboard. After we get the whole 200 feet out, the base plate locks in place, and we now have a rigid structure that allows us to do the mapping as required. You see the view out the commander's window of the mast with the antenna in place and ready to start the next activity, which is flipping that antenna over so it, the radiating, the receiving face will point at the Earth. And then we can maneuver it to the 45-degree angle to the horizon that's required for mapping. As Janet mentioned, the main 
beam in the bay is a radiator, and both the outboard and the center receive the signal. The X-band can actually track trees. The C-band is a longer wavelength than just as land. This shows you how the map was produced. Because the Earth turns underneath the shuttle as it rotates, the subsequent paths are 23 degrees apart. So it was a very challenging task for the folks that got the award earlier this evening to make sure that each one of those next paths lined right up to the one that was done earlier. Once we get all that set up, the major crew activity is to change tapes. We had to change 330 tapes in the course of our nine-day mapping mission. That's about a tape every half hour, and you see a memorial and me doing one of the many tape changes that we had to do. One of the uh, maneuvers that we had to do sp that were, uh, it was <laughs> special on this flight was a fly cast maneuver, and uh, well into the flight after we had gotten comfortable with that, we pulled out the fishing hats and fishing poles and, and uh, set up some props um, to do that. But this fly cast maneuver is a very special maneuver that uses um, <laughs> specially uh, designed procedures and accurately timed pulses of the, of the jets to uh, make sure that the mass doesn't exceed its limitations. If you look on the far right side, you can see that the mass is really moving here. Um, there's no subsequent oscillations and, uh, and movements, and that's because of those specially and carefully timed pulses keep it um, from, from doing that. And maybe we'll have time later to tell you about that fly cast maneuver, but here it was working just flawlessly. Every single time we did it, it moved back and stopped just like we had hoped for. Since we were taking data 24 hours a day, we were a two-shift mission. Three people were working while pe three people were either eating or sleeping or exercising. This is the blue shift during one of their meals, getting ready for the evening. Uh, this is Dom doing another tape change, Dom and Janice on the, on the blue shift. We had to, as everybody said, over 300 times we had to do this, so we'll show later on a little crea creativity that this uh, generated. Uh, at the beginning of uh, the red shift morning, this is uh, where we slept. <laughs> this is me and Gerhard getting out of our sleep bunks. They're aligned on the wall. Of course, in space, it doesn't matter which orientation that you sleep, but we have ourselves sort of tied in here and these sleeping bunks on the wall. And of course, after we get up in the morning, we need to take care of some things, some hygiene. Here's me washing my hair. Gerhard is having some breakfast while he exercises on the bike. Uh, Dom gets off his shift and gets back on the bike and uh, prepares to, to go to bed while the red shift then takes over. Uh, Gerhard's here changing another tape. And before we did anything, we always got confirmation from another crew member that we were uh, activating the correct recorder so that we didn't make any mistakes. And here's again just some uh, daily housekeeping chores of changing the bio containers for the CO2 scrubbing. Astronauts are engaged in variety of work besides radar data taking. Here, Janice is showing a medical kit. At her left hand side on the swimming window, you see an electronic camera for the EarthCom experiment. We use a variety of cameras to take Earth photographs. We would like to show you some of the uh, fantastic views of our planet taken by an HDTV camera. Coming from the direction of the Pacific Ocean, this is uh, South America, uh, Bolivia. Here's beautiful coral and sand of the Bahamas. Although observation and the water is not possible by radar, it is possible by HDTV. This is an interesting feature of the ray chart wind structure seen in Mauritania, Africa. Next is the uh, desert of Saudi Arabia, where you can see many uh, black circles, which are irrigation patterns. Here, an angled view of Mount Fuji and Tokyo Bay. You can see the uh, Tokyo metropolitan area. We flew over Honshu at o Ocean Sangland. Just downside of the uh, lake around the center of the uh, picture is Tsukuba, where uh, Tsukuba Space Center is located. Uh, this is the uh, southern Russia and the Black Sea. We again passed the coastlines of South America. This time you can see Ecuador and Peru. Now we are flying over the Mediterranean Sea. There's a Malta, Sicily, and the toll and the hill of Italy. This is Kamchatka Peninsula, featuring a series of 
volcanoes. Well, after we got all the data, it was time to stow the mast. Uh, here we have a beautiful sight of the boom, and this was the task of the blue shift with uh, Jan Janice and Dom and Mamoru, and here the mast comes in, and it worked just as the deploy in reverse, but not quite, and you will see it w why when it happens, and at that very moment, Janet and my hopes were soaring very high. Unfortunately, uh, the hopes were only soaring high, but not the reality. Uh, here it stops just two inches short. Uh, the people on the ground uh, were just up to speed and developed some procedures. Here we see the flight director and the Capcom and MCC, and they uh, worked together with the park. And the lid closed on us. The park was celebrating, and there were some tears on orbit. Uh, but after a long mission almost came to an end, there was time to have some fun, and you can see the smiling faces uh, also because the mission was at this point in time already such a great success. We knew that uh, all the data had been gathered, and as Kevin said earlier, when you had worked successfully, you got some rewards. Uh, we saw <laughs> Janet with chocolate, and Mamoru demonstrates us a specific zero-g way to eat tortillas. Well, and as you know, in space you can do a lot of things. This is a huge water bubble, and in that we have injected rice uh, cookies and also chrysanthemum. Is that correct, <laughs> Mamoru? Chrysanthemum. And our brave pilot just sucks it up completely. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see he enjoys like someone who survived something that he did not know. And <laughs> of course, enjoyment also includes some dancing, and please to be sure to <laughs> include some applause for Ginger afterwards. <laughs> and Janet mentioned already that we had to introduce some creative ways of tape changes, and this is just one of those, <laughs> which we refer to as the <laughs> slam dunk tape change. <laughs> and then, of course, it was time to come home again, much too early. It seemed like we had just launched and it was time to come home and we uh, got into landing day quite uh, aggressively and we then had to wait an extra orbit because the crosswinds were a little bit high at the Cape, um, which, which forced us to come home an hour and a half later and the sun was a little bit lower and with that sun angle, that gave the folks on the ground at KSC a couple hundred miles of visibility of the space shuttle as we were approaching. They saw the shuttle probably as early as it's ever been seen and uh, here we see a picture of the camera looking out the front window as Kevin is now flying us manually uh, smoothly onto center line and you can see the uh, symbol overlaying the runway at KSC at runway uh, 33. We intentionally lower the landing gear on the space shuttle at 300 feet and here we see the, the landing gear coming down. People on the ground will often wonder why it's coming down so late but uh, that's the uh, intended um, time to put it down because the space shuttle doesn't glide very well. Um, but here the gear is coming down and we see a beautiful picture as Kevin smoothly brings us over the threshold and it was just a perfect, smooth, flawless landing. You can see nearly a zero rated ascent as the uh, tires spin up um, as we touch down and you can see us rolling out on the runway. We were trying to do a, a test with the uh, crosswind so we delayed putting the drag chute out until the nose gear touches down and at that time you can see a, a charge blow out a drogue chute which pulls out the main parachute and the parachute uh, helps us slow down a little bit more than the, uh, the brakes do, so we limit the uh, use on that. Here you can see Kevin smoothly tracking the center line as we're rolling out. And then at 60 knots, we jettison the parachute so that the, w the big lines there don't damage the uh, engine bells. And they're the uh, 14th flight for Endeavour and the 97th space shuttle flight in our history is complete. <laughs> It takes us about a half hour to get out. Our mission is over, but uh, there's years of work for the engineers. Uh, our aim was to try to map the majority of the Earth's surface between 60 degrees north and 60 degrees uh, south. Uh, it was done with a lot of folks here at JSC, JPL, and our sponsor was a national imagery and mapping. Scene.